great Super Bowl. There you go. Back to serious stuff, though. I'm Melissa Francis. The president set to leave the White House later this hour for a speech in Cincinnati. He will be followed by the continued fallout over the FISA memo. The president now says it's totally vindicated. And intelligence chairman Devin Nunez says, despite the criticism, Republicans did the right thing. A footnote saying that something might be political is a far cry from letting the American people know that the Democrats in the Hillary campaign paid for dirt that the FBI then used to get a warrant on an American citizen to spy on another campaign. And it's, very, it's a very dangerous precedent that was set. But the top Democrat on the committee says this has nothing to do with transparency. Here's Adam Schiff. They voted that down. They voted against hearing from the FBI. When you do oversight, you haul them in under oath. You say, why was this included? Why was that included? The interest wasn't oversight. The interest was a political hit job on the FBI in the service of the president. And now Democrats want their own memo released. A vote on that set for later today. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live with the latest. Boy, busy Monday, John. Take it away. <sighs> Yeah, you know, as it is every week here, Melissa, no question about that. The House Intelligence Committee will gather at 5 o'clock this afternoon for a business meeting to discuss whether or not to release and send that Democratic rebuttal to the Republican memo to the president for his review. Sources tell Fox News that this Democratic memo portrays Devin Nunes and Trey Gowdy as misleading the American public with the Republican memo and talks about possible collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia to influence the election. The president weighing in, meantime, on Democratic criticism of the Republican memo, saying, quote, little Adam Schiff, who is desperate to run for higher office, is one of the biggest liars and leakers in Washington, right up there with Comey, Warner, Brennan, and Clapper. Adam leaves closed committee hearings to illegally leak confidential information must be stopped. Well, clearly, Adam Schiff caught a whiff of that because he tweeted right back at the president. Mr. President, I see you've had a busy morning of executive time. Instead of tweeting false smears, the American people would appreciate if you turned off the TV and helped solve the funding crisis, protected dreamers, or really anything else. The chairman of the Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunes, had a similar assessment of his Democratic colleague as the president did. Listen here. Mr. Schiff uh, knows that he's spreading a, a false uh, narrative there, uh, but that's not new for him. He spread false narrative the entire time. So the Democrats were well aware uh, that I did not leak information. Uh, however, for a year they stayed quiet. Uh, they continued, they, they advocated for my removal from the committee. And President Trump backed up Nunez in a tweet last hour, writing, quote, Representative Devin Nunez, a man of tremendous courage and grit, may someday be recognized as a great American hero for what he has exposed and what he has had to endure. As for the Republican memo, the president appeared to claim exoneration in the Russia investigation over the weekend as a result of that memo and learning about the fact that the FISA warrant was derived from uh, that unverified dossier. The president tweeting, this memo totally vindicates Trump, in quotation marks, in probe. I assume he's talking about the campaign there. But the Russia witch hunt goes on and on. There was no collusion and there was no obstruction, the word now used, because after one year of looking endlessly and finding nothing, collusion is dead. This is an American disgrace. However, South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy, who co-wrote the Republican memo, said, wait a minute here, the memo is not the final word in the Russia investigation. Listen. There is a Russia investigation without a dossier. So to the extent that the memo deals with the dossier and the FISA process, the dossier has nothing to do with the meeting at Trump Tower. The dossier has nothing to do with an email sent by Cambridge Analytica. The dossier really has nothing to do with George Papadopoulos' meeting in Great Britain. Um, it also doesn't have anything to do with obstruction of justice. So there's going to be a Russia probe even without a dossier. There's going to be a Russia probe even without a dossier. And the Mueller investigation continues unabated. Uh, we don't know when that's going to end. We don't know what else is to come down the pike. The president turning his attention to tax reform. He's going to Cincinnati, as you pointed out later on this hour, for a big tax reform speech. He's also thinking about DACA, and we also expect that maybe, just maybe, Melissa, he just might mention this memo in his speech in Cincinnati. If I were a betting man. Oh, boy. John Roberts, thank you. Thank you.
Here now with more, Catherine Lucy, White House reporter for the Associated Press. So we understand that uh, the House will vote today, the House committee will vote today on whether to release the Democrats' counterpoint to this Republican memo. What are the chances that that actually gets released? Well, we expect there may be a vote today. Obviously, there's some time to go before before that committee hearing. And um, if I think the big question now is, does it get out? It, it didn't last week. If it does, it could come to the White House for a review, and, and then we have to see what happens there. It could, could go undergo a similar process to the Republican memo. I, I was surprised in reading the Republican memo because there were critics who said, uh, you know, it reveals sources and methods. I did not see anything of the kind in there. Did you? I think the question that the critics are raising is whether this kind of process information should be put out there at all, and so there is there, there are questions about that. Um, obviously, it didn't sort of put to rest um, uh, the investigation either. As you saw these comments from Trey Gowdy, um, the investigation continues. It doesn't. Uh, you know, fully, uh, you know, clear, uh, you know, the, the president or anything like that. Yeah, the the, the investigation continues. He seemed to say, but yeah. uh, Republicans are also saying that the investigation would not have reached this point uh, had it not been for the perhaps erroneous reliance on the Steele dossier. Well, I think what we know right now is that the investigation began, um, you know, without without the dossier, but that the dossier has played a part in the FISA process. And I think there's a lot more information we probably need to get to understand the, the, the full, um, you know, the, the, the full full read on that. And, and the president, uh, I mean, despite his protestations, this memo doesn't clear him necessarily. Yeah, the president said over the weekend that this fully vindicates him, but I think you saw over the weekend a lot of Republicans, including Gowdy, saying, no, not so fast. Um, you know, there's still an investigation. There's still aspects of this investigation that, that have to be resolved. But it does raise, you know, the, the question of politicization of intelligence. Uh, you've got Democrats and Republicans both looking at highly classified stuff and sort of reaching their own conclusions about what it means and, and, and where it should go. Certainly it raises questions about intelligence. It, it also raises questions about are you setting a precedent in terms of what gets released to the public uh, you know, during an investigation? Yeah, and but the but the public, uh, it is interesting to read exactly what the court relied on and you know who uh, what the court was presented with. Now, I guess Democrats are saying what that that um, we don't have the whole picture of of how big a role the Steele dossier played in um, in in what the court what the FISA court. Uh, decided to do with regard to surveillance of, of Carter Page? That's right. Democrats are saying that the Republican memo is not a full um, a full explanation of the process. That's why they are pushing to release their own memo. They say that will provide more information on, on what went into this FISA process. H has that memo been, I mean, has the Democrats' memo been um, fully vetted? That's what Republicans say they did with theirs. Um, no, I think it's it's still in process. So as, as you said earlier, the committee still has to decide whether they would release it. If, if they did, and if there is classified information in it, the White House then would have to do their own review as they did with the Republican memo and decide how to proceed. All right, uh, Catherine Lucy, the White House correspondent for the Associated Press, they're at the White House right now. Catherine, thank you. Thank you. Another deadly Amtrak crash, this time in South Carolina. The feds are now saying the train was likely on the wrong track. We'll have the latest with that. Plus, two senators unveiling a new immigration plan, but it's missing one major item that has President Trump already saying no deal. We'll tell you what that item is, but first, here's the president from the Republican retreat last week. They talk a good game with DACA, but they don't produce. And so we're, either they come on board or we're just going to have to really work and we're going to have to get more people so we can get the kind of numbers that we need to pass in a much easier fashion legislation. Right now in Arizona, man faces second degree murder charges after police say he gunned down off-duty fire Captain Kyle Brayer after some sort of altercation. It seems right before the shooting, Brayer was riding in a golf cart when the suspect's car bumped the rear of it. Police say Brayer approached the driver, and that's when he was shot in the head. He died a short time later at the hospital. Police identify the suspect as Hezron Parks, 
They say he initially ran from the scene, but then turned himself in hours later after seeing media reports describing his car. Breaking right now, the Senate looking to hammer out a new immigration deal to avoid another budget standoff. Senators John McCain and Chris Coons unveiling a bipartisan plan to protect so-called dreamers, provide a path to citizenship, and set aside money for border security. But they aren't funding the wall. President Trump saying that's a non-starter. Tweeting this morning, quote, any deal on DACA that does not include strong border security and the desperately needed wall is a total waste of time. March 5th is rapidly approaching and the Dems seem not to care about DACA. Make a deal. Lawmakers have until Thursday to show some progress before government funding runs out. Senator Dick Durbin is not optimistic. There is not likely to be a DACA deal, though we're working every single day on, on telephone calls and uh, person to person to try to reach this bipartisan agreement. I think the president's position that he's taking on the, the Dreamers and DACA is very bold. I think he's boxed the Democrats in on that issue. I think it's going to be very difficult for them to walk away from. He's giving more than I probably would have given in the same, in, in the same uh, as advice to him. Karl Rove is a former senior advisor and deputy chief of staff for George W. Bush and a Fox News contributor. Sir, you think this has any traction? Will it go anywhere? Well, I don't think so. Uh, we've got three proposals out there. We've got McCain Coons, which says we'll fix DACA. The Dreamers will be able to remain and find a path to citizenship. We will have a study in 2020 on what's needed for border security and what works. So we will take 18, 19, and 20, and sometime in 20 we'll have a study on how to secure the border. We'll spend $110 million over five years, $20 million plus a year, on improving the relationship between local law enforcement and the federal government. There's our, this is a longstanding existing program. The federal government gives local law enforcement money to participate in, uh, in training to, so that they know how to deal with, with illegal aliens. But this is, a, this is a minor deal, minor. And then we will have 165 more new immigration judges over the next three years plus uh, attorneys so that we can expedite removals from the country and adjudicate these cases. Again, worthwhile and useful, but in the greater scheme of things, minor. Second option is kick the can down the road, delay, keep the DACA uh, situation as it is today for one more year. And then finally, we have President Trump who says DACA fix, do something about chain migration, get rid of the diversity lottery and have the wall and technology to defend the border. Yeah. My gut is, is that there's so much difference between these two that this ain't going to go anywhere. Even if this doesn't go anywhere, yeah. this may be a situation where there's got to be more than this and less than that in order to get something done. How do Democrats justify opposing what the president is offering in the sense that how do they go back to two million dreamers and say, we said no to your deal. We say no to citizens and protecting the border in, because we are so upset about theoretical immigrants out in the future. Yeah. Well, look, uh, the Democrats do have a problem here because remember, they could have solved this any way they wanted to in 2009 and 10 when they had overwhelming majorities in the Congress. Uh, President Obama had opposed comprehensive reform in 2007, helped to gut it despite having said that he was in favor of it. He did nothing in 2009 and 10 when they could have done anything. He continued to say until 2012 that he didn't have the statutory authority which I, I agree with him, he didn't have the statutory authority to, to affect a dreamer solution by executive order. But then he did in 2012, motivated by the fact that it, Hispanic enthusiasm for his reelection was low. Mm. So th they got to get something done on this, though, because here's yeah. why. Think about this. 1.8 million dreamers, most of them employed. They hold jobs. This uncertainty about whether or not they're, they're, they're going to be able to stay here is going to affect the labor market. It's going to affect their employers. Imagine what would happen if overnight 1.2, 1.3 million people who are now today working in America were told you can no longer work. Uh, yeah. it, it would be a disaster. And, and remember, we're talking about the president's primary goal is to get economic growth up. It, the gross democratic, the, the gross domestic product is is, two, is a combination of two things: labor and productivity. Yeah. If you take a whole chunk of laborers no, out absolutely. and a whole bunch of workers. It, yeah. it, it hurts economic growth. Lab, labor is good, so is consumption, and they, they satisfy both of those things. Let me ask you, though, I mean, don't they have a playbook? They got tax reform through. So don't they have a playbook now for getting something done, even if the Democrats don't help? 
Well, they, they can't because you need 60 votes in the Senate. But here's how it might play out. McCain Coons comes to the Senate floor. In the Senate, the rules are looser. You can have lots of amendments. Uh, uh, Leader McConnell has said he's going to have open debate on this. So McCain Coons comes to the floor and it gets amended. And some things have to do with uh, with uh, chain migration. Some things have to do with border security. Some things have to do with maybe uh, the wall or funding for the wall. Mm -hmm. and, and the Senate passes a bill that it can agree with. It goes to the House. The House will probably toughen it. And they go back and forth, pinging, either pinging bills back and forth between each other or going to a conference committee to see if they can arrive at a, a solution and you end up somewhere in the middle you you have a lot more than McCain McCain Coons yeah. but you might have something less than and look one one option is to say look we want we want to we want to get, we'll give you money to fix the wall right now and build some 25 more miles or 50 more, more miles, but we want a comprehensive study done, but not a three year study. Yeah. We want a study done in six months by, by the Homeland Security Department to tell us where they want to build the wall and justify and come back to us. In the meantime, we will give you money for technology, infrastructure, and, and fix the, fix in the in existing words, wall and a few a more miles of wall. Get together make a and deal. make a deal. I don't know how Democrats turn around and go back to those almost 2 million dreamers and say, we said no. We said no to you right. becoming citizens because of something off in the future with theoretical other immigrants. It's going to be a real challenge for them. We'll see. Yep. Carl Rove, thank you so much. We appreciate your insight. You thank you. Well, after Friday's massive stock sell-off, will Wall Street be feeling more pain? We'll check in on the markets this morning. Plus, late-night host Jimmy Kimmel under fire for what he said about conservatives. Our media panel weighs in on his comments. on the powerful central bank and Powell's expected to stick with Yellen's plan raising interest rates several times this year. Let's take a live look at the Dow down about 80 points right now. The markets are reacting to changes at the Fed after Friday's steep sell off. The second deadly Amtrak train crash in less than a week. Investigators say the train in South Carolina yesterday was on the wrong track and slammed into a freight train, killing two people and injuring more than 100. It came less than a week after another Amtrak train carrying Republicans to a congressional retreat hit a truck on the tracks in Virginia, killing one person and injuring several, several others. Jonathan Seary joins us from South Carolina. Boy, give us more details on this one, Jonathan. Yeah, hi, Melissa. Terrible accidents, renewing calls for safety on America's railways. There is a GPS-based uh, safety system called Positive Train Control, or PTC. It monitors the locations of trains and positions of switches and can prevent trains from going too fast or colliding. It's supposed to be fully implemented by the end of the year, but previous deadlines have been extended determining the exact status of the installation of PTC will be something that will be very important for us to find out. But, but to be clear, PTC is designed, an operational PTC system is designed to prevent this type of accident. Today, NTSB investigators plan to interview surviving members of the Amtrak crew while memories are still fresh. They've already recovered a forward-facing video recorder from the Amtrak train, which may give clues as to tr the train's speed before impact. The NTSB is also trying to determine why a track switch was locked in the wrong position, sending the train onto a side track where an empty CSX freight train was parked. It just derailed. I just felt it go up and didn't, I was in the floor. I don't remember much after that. It about knocked, it knocked me out of there. Yeah, the impact killed an engineer and conductor riding on board the locomotive of the Amtrak train. More than 100 people were injured. Uh, six of them remain hospitalized. The NTSB plans to release more details at a news conference late this afternoon. Melissa? Jonathan Sear, thank you. Well, the Philadelphia Eagles soar to their first ever Super Bowl win, upsetting the New England Patriots 41-33. And it was all about gutsy plays like this one. Philly's defense helping the team score a field goal and a 41-33 lead. Then an incomplete Hail Mary pass. Tom Brady to Gronkowski helped seal the victory. While Eagles players celebrated on the field, 
Fans back home mobbed the streets for their own celebrations. Many flocked to Broad Street, where the crowd stretched for half a mile. Unfortunately, things did get a bit out of hand. We will have it all in a live report coming up. So the war over dueling memos heating up on Capitol Hill. The White House says the memo proves Bob dossier. Fox News has obtained the unclassified version of a criminal referral requested by the Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge is live in Washington with the details on that. Catherine. Well, thank you, John. The Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, along with Senator Lindsey Graham, sent a criminal referral to the Justice Department last month asking for an investigation of the former British spy who put together the dossier and whether he lied to the FBI about his contacts with the media. Fox News has obtained this unclassified version of the criminal referral, and while it's heavily redacted, Senators Grassley and Graham write about another stream of information that was going to steal. The unclassified criminal referral reads in part quote, it is troubling enough that the Clinton campaign funded Mr. Steele's work, but that these Clinton associates were contemporaneously feeding Mr. Steele allegations raises additional concerns about his credibility. The senators are now asking the FBI and Justice Department for an emergency declassification review of this document I just showed you that's so heavily redacted because they say a lot of the information was declassified Friday in that House memo. And just as one example of what appears to be overclassification by the FBI and Justice Department, there's a reference to a Washington Post report. It appears to be about the dossier, but the entire section uh, is blacked out, John. Even though that's material that would have been available to anybody who wanted to read that's the Washington correct. Post. That's exactly right. Ah, fascinating stuff. Catherine, mm -hmm. uh, great job. Thank you. You're welcome. So the debate continues to rage over the Nunez memo. President Trump says it vindicates him of any collusion. Democrats, though, shockingly disagree. Of course, not at all. And in fact, uh, on the issue of collusion, what the memo indicates is the investigation didn't begin with Carter Page. It actually began with George Papadopoulos, someone who was a foreign policy advisor for candidate Trump uh, and someone who was meeting secretly with the Russians and talking about the stolen Clinton emails. I actually don't think it has any impact on the Russia probe for this reason. The memo has no impact on the Russia probe. No, not, not to me it doesn't, and I was pretty integrally involved in the drafting of it. And the fact that the Republicans in the House refused to allow a minority report, the Democratic response to their memo, is an indication that this, they're just bound and determined uh, to continue to find ways to absolve this president from any responsibility. We had collusion, conspiracy, you know, people were accused of treason and no one is making that accusation anymore at least no one serious even Diane Feinstein has said there's no evidence of collusion and I think that's the point the president is making Whew. all right so let's bring in our panel Richard Fowler is a radio talk show host and a Fox News contributor Brad Blakeman is a former deputy assistant to President George W Bush Brad if we're still trying to figure out who may have helped the Russians or colluded with them among Americans? Does does the memo absolve the president of that search? Well, I, I think the memo sheds light on, on, if anything, the incompetence and bias of the FBI. The FBI relied on a political uh, hit job opposition piece by a, a British spy paid for through a pass-through company, Fusion GPS, by the Democrats. And the fact that the court relied on this document, I think it's it's more telling about how the FBI got this uh, warrant in order to spy on a campaign than anything else. I'd like to hear from the FISA judge. I want to know what he relied on, what he was told, because the FBI could be criminally liable for uh, getting a warrant that they were not entitled to based on uh, the evidence proffered to the court. So Donald okay. Trump is right. There is no evidence of, uh, of collusion, if anything that shows bias on the part of the FBI. Richard, I mean, you heard Republicans there say, no, you know, this doesn't exonerate him entirely, um, that there still is a lot of trail to follow here in terms of who cooperated. What do you think? Oh, I disagree with Brad, and I think if you want, in that package that we just saw there, you saw Trey Gowdy, who is the Republican, who's actually seen the underlying classification. No, that's what I just said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
he saw the documents. Devin Nunes has not seen the documents, and Devin Nunes and his staff, his staff who authored this memo, might have seen the documents. But Devin Nunes himself had not seen these documents. A lot of the Republican intelligence individuals who have spoken out have not seen these documents. Trey Gowdy has seen all the underlying documents in the FISA memo, which, if you listen to Comey testimony a couple years ago, he indicated a FISA memo is about the size of your risk, how thick it is, right? So the fa fact that we are specu we are speculating on a document or a memo that was written by one side of the aisle with no input from the well, other we're side. Gonna see, we're going to see the other side because it, it's untrue to say that it was blocked. It was just that it has to go through the same no, vetting process that the Republicans I'm, I'm did. I'm just saying that okay. this particular memo is one-sided and okay. the facts speak to the fa If you t listen to folks who've seen the intelligence like Trey Gowdy, they indicate that this doesn't vindicate the president at all because the, Don, the John Jr. meeting still happened in Trump Tower. George Papadopoulos is still the person that triggered the investigation okay, there, and this memo confirms that. questions here as well. Um, that need to be followed. For example, here's Governor Radcliffe. I can tell you that I have looked at uh, the underlying source documents, which include um, uh, more revelations regarding Bruce Orr and his wife, Nellie, and the connection with GPS. There was a direct pipeline um, uh, into the DOJ, essentially from the uh, Democratic National Committee and, and Fusion GPS that is troubling. More bad details are going to come out about that, unfortunately. Who at the FBI was aware of that? We're still determining that. Brad, I mean, you can't really get around this. If it's okay for one political party to go out and create a dossier like this and feed it into the FBI to listen to another campaign. I would wonder if the Democrats, if this is okay, are comfortable with President Trump doing that in 2018 or 2020. What do you think? This is not America. This is not our justice system to pin one party to stick a government agency on another. Look, the FBI was convinced Hillary was going to win. They were trying to help her both in the email investigation and in uh, this bogus uh, collusion uh, investigation. Even Inspector Clouseau could figure out that Papadopoulos and Page were wannabes. They had they had no connection with the uh, campaign that rose to the level of getting a warrant. Th this is crazy stuff. And I'm talking about the court of public opinion now. The, the American public's fed up. They're fed up with the FBI. And I'll okay. tell you one thing. In this town, the fact that nothing leaked with regard to collusion or conspiracy against Trump tells you everything Richard, because if there was something uh, there, Richard, there hang on, would have heard hey, Richard, I, I want to ask you a question. Are Democrats comfortable with the idea of the RNC coming up with a dossier that was similar and going after whoever is running in 2018 or 2020 of taking the exact same steps? Are Democrats comfortable with that? I mean, I think there's, there, that's a loaded question, and the reason why I think that's a loaded question is because we really don't know how much the Steele dossier played in getting the Carter it Page. It played a part. It, so it, it could have been, but it could have been, but wait, so yeah, a part, but a part, wait a minute, are you comfortable wait a minute, with Melissa. That being put together but, and used but, again. But facts matter here. A part could be 1%, or a fact could, a part could be 50%. And 1% and 50% is a, there's a big variation between those two numbers. They and said it would because, not we know, the entire because, because, it. because we know that so there was four with them doing renewals. It 1%? Are you comfortable with Democrats doing that? Well, 1%? It, it all depends on what the FBI actually used from this document. And did they corroborate? If they used it, this are you comfortable with that? It taints the it entire depends, document. It all depends upon what's in the document. I'll give you an example. If, if, if my house was robbed and I hire a private investigator, and the private investigator who's on my side, who I'm paying, finds evidence that says his house was indeed robbed, here's the fingerprints found, and they turn it over to the police, are you saying the police shouldn't use that, in, in, that, that evidence because I paid for it? I think you're making another example, and you didn't answer my question. If the but that's the example that, exactly that but the variation is what matters here, and what also okay. matters is if the FBI found additional information on top of that that corroborates that evidence, and we know they did they based they on the fact. They, based their on testimony the fact, said they couldn't confirm but it. But we can make that speculation go. based on no, the fact that there was actually, four FISA renewals every ninety days, and for that to happen, you have to go back to a judge. We mistakenly said that John Radcliffe was governor; he's a congressman. Thanks to both of you. Appreciate your time. John. Well, the disgraced former USA Gymnastics team doctor Larry Nasser, the Justice Department is trying to deal with him, offering more time in prison for molesting young athletes in his care. Details ahead. Plus, late night host Jimmy Kimmel getting slammed on social media for what he said about conservatives Saturday. Our media panel on deck to break it all down.
estate of Dr. Larry Nasser, a judge sentencing Nasser to 40 to 125 years behind bars. It's the disgraced USA gymnastics team doctor's third prison sentence in a sex abuse scandal that has shaken the sports world. More than 260 women and young girls came forward to accuse Nasser of molesting them while they were under his care. To call Devin Nunes Donald Trump's lapdog would be an insult to dogs and laps. He's not a lapdog. He's more of a retriever. Here, boy, go write me a memo to smear the FBI. Good, good boy. Jimmy Kimmel unleashing on House Intelligence Committee Chairman Devin Nunes for writing the memo alleging surveillance abuse by the FBI and the Department of Justice. Kimmel attacking conservatives as well during a progressive podcast over the weekend. He said that almost every TV talk show host in late night is liberal because that requires a level of intelligence. Let's bring in our media panel. Joe Concha is media reporter for The Hill. Judy Miller, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter, author, and Fox News contributor. So, Judy, um, this podcast is, is something that was put together by a bunch of former Obama administration officials. They invited Jimmy Kimmel on, and he says that if you're going to be a TV talk show host in late night, you've got to be intelligent and and therefore conservatives need not apply. What do you think? Well, Jimmy Kimmel finally said something funny, or at least liberals will find it funny. Conservatives just find it predictable and outrageous. I think Jimmy Kimmel should be working at MSNBC, which has an obviously anti-Trump left of center open and obvious point of view. But, you know, look, I may agree with Jimmy Kimmel on the sorry state of our health care system, and I may agree that our gun laws are outrageous, but I think that suggesting that people who are conservative are not intelligent is just over the top, over the line, outrageous, and it smacks of the smug satisfaction that helped elect Donald Trump. So I hope the Hillary uh, Clinton viewers are happy, but for everybody yeah. else take note, this kind of, of uh, smugness really is, is going to backfire. One way, Joe, to ensure that, that you don't last long in network television is to insult half your audience. <laughs> well, yeah, I like what Kimmel said. He said, you know, it requires a certain level of intelligence. Actually, it requires a certain level of conformity. In other words, if I watch Kimmel or Colbert or Trevor Noah or Sam B, it's all the same thing. Judy Kurtz, who is uh, a writer over at The Hill, uh, she wrote a great story last week that uh, said, is television headed for a dump on Trump overload? And, you know, perhaps we are, because how many times can we just do the same thing, one trick pony over and over again? But to Judy's point, where she says she agrees with uh, Jimmy Kimmel on health care, she's not agreeing with Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, no. According to the Daily Beast last year, they did a great report that Kimmel actually gets his talking points for his monologue, particularly on health care, directly from Chuck Schumer's office. Could you imagine Johnny Carson getting talking points from Daniel Patrick Moynihan? I mean, Carson didn't keep it political, and I think that's why he didn't lose half his audience, and that's probably a good thing. But Kimball's already said, John, I don't care if Trump supporters watch. I can take him or leave him. Don't need him. And that's the way things are going now in late night. They're only appealing to half the country. They don't seem to care. Yeah. Right. Uh, Judy, th there weren't a lot of Barack Obama jokes that, uh, that Jimmy <laughs> no. Kimmel uh, passed along. No, and I mean this kind of openly uh, political, openly partisan uh, late night talk show host is what's driving young people away from late night TV and towards social media, less and less towards television. And, you know, I think that people like Kimmel, he he he's talking to his audience, which is liberal, and if he wants to write off half of the country, that's fine. But, you know, have we gotten to the point where you can just write off people? Uh, ultimately, they bite back. And I think Kimmel will see that in his ratings eventually. And as we all know, in TV, that's what counts. Meanwhile, some criticism of the media from a member of the media, Michael Goodwin, who, who calls himself a liberal, uh, wrote this in his latest column. He says, thanks to the battle over the memo, that's the Nunes memo, we also know with 100% certainty that the mainstream media is part of the swamp. The efforts by the New York Times and the Washington Post, among others, to keep the memo from ever seeing sunshine were appalling 
Before it saw the memo, the Times editorial page called it proof of the Republican plot against the FBI. A Washington Post columnist warned President Trump he would be making a historic mistake in releasing it. Uh, now, Judy, I'm going to go to you first because you did say before this memo came out that, that you were concerned about it releasing sources and methods. Did it do that? Well, I don't think that it did, but it's, you know, John, it's very hard to know that. What we do know is that the FBI said that...